That would be a nightmare. An absolute nightmare. I'm Lucas Fabro, a violin maker in Cremona, and today we're going to be looking at some violin making scenes from three different films and see how real they are. Whisper of the Heart Whisper of the Heart is a 1995 Japanese film written by Hayao Miyazaki and animated by Studio Ghibli. It tells the story of a 14-year-old girl who loves reading books and soon realizes that all the books she has at the library have been read by the same person before her. This person turns out to be a young boy who she finds infuriating and with whom they eventually end up, of course, liking each other. One day, following a cat, yep, she discovers a beautiful antique shop on the top of a hill run by an old man. Soon she finds out that on the lower floor of this shop, there's a workshop where this old man's grandson is learning to make violins with the hope to eventually move and study in Cremona. Oh, and this boy is obviously the one that she fancies, the one of the books. This looks very real. There are wood chips on the floor, he's got a cloth on the workbench, which is something that sometimes can be used to either protect the wood, the finished part, and to keep it from sliding. The stool is like the ones violin makers usually use, the violin hanging are exactly how I used to have them in my previous workshop. The details are quite good, even if the wood he's removing seems to make no effect on the scroll. The only thing is that I don't think it's good to work on that part of the scroll that way for a couple of reasons. First of all, holding things with one hand and working with the other means that the wood is going to move in the same direction as the force applied. Hence, he would be losing strength and precision in the cut. Secondly, and maybe even more important for safety reasons, holding the scroll with one hand right behind and in the same direction that he's making the cut with the gouge means that if he misses, then he will cut his hand so badly that I don't think he will be making violence again. The way he looks at the scroll uh, to see if the chamfers are symmetrical is very realistic too. Ah, more no. Mm -hmm. These questions are so typical for someone who's never met a violin maker before. Exactly. That's true, although it also depends on other things such as the quality of the wood and the materials used. ここでバイオリン作りの教室もやってるからさ。でもあなたのもあるんでしょ？うん。ねえ、どれどれ？あれ。わあ、これ。The way he behaves and replies can be so common as well, almost cold and indifferent to the typical questions. The tool board is very authentic as well, even if there are not many tools. And here on the right we have an internal mold and an external mold. If you're a violinist or if you're interested in learning how to play the instrument, then I wanted to share with you that I recently started a new collaboration with Tombez. They are an amazing platform that offer unique masterclasses from world-renowned musicians and they have a special discount deal for my followers offering a 30% off and a 14-day trial using the code FABROVIOLINS. Link in the description for more. それより俺さ、バイオリン作りになりたいんだ。そうか、もうあんなに上手だもんね。私ね。イタリアのクレモーナにバイオリン制作学校があるんだよ。中学校出たらそこへ行きたいんだ。I that's a very common fear for people who have to leave everything behind to come to Cremona to do this without knowing if they will be good enough, if the sacrifice is worth it. And unfortunately, as we are so many and as it's a very difficult and long path to make it, quite a few people drop along the way. 
素敵な町だといいねうん古い町だってバイオリン作りの職人がたくさん住んでるんだすごいな The city is indeed very old and beautiful. I'm not sure what people think of the profession as it's not a question I've asked around, but I believe that most of the citizens feel joy because, in a way, we make this place a bit more special. This movie is not only beautiful and enjoying, but apparently very inspiring as well. I know it's been a big influence on some luthiers, mainly those from Japan, and I've also met people who are not related to the violin making world. But decided to visit Cremona just because of this film. Most of the violin scenes and dialogue are very realistic, so I'm guessing the producers have a luthier as a consultant helping them along the way. So for this, I'm going to rate the movie with 8 scrolls out of 10, and I'm going to rate the violin making scenes in the movie with an 8 as well. Public Works. This 2015 Dutch movie, based on a book of the same name and set in the 19th century, depicts the story of a violin maker who rejects selling his property to a developer group in the hopes of getting more money for it. The goal of the developers instead is to build a hotel where his workshop is. For being a movie about a violin maker, well, I guess that's not really the main point of the movie, I must say that there are not many scenes of him working or on his workshop. However, From what is actually visible, the film got a few things wrong and a couple of things right. This is the first approach we see of him as a violin maker and seller. Just the way he brushes the instrument gives me some discomfort. I would always grab the instrument with one hand from the neck, yes. But the other hand most likely will be on the end pin or somewhere where I'm not touching the varnish of the instrument. Makers know how delicate it can be, how the acid from the hands can damage it, and how annoying it can be to remove fingerprints from the instruments, so we try to avoid it as much as possible. Same thing about the hands, although in this one he did better, he reduced the amount of fingers on the instrument. Actually, he only used a couple of fingers to touch it and he did it closer to the edge. By the way he's looking at it, it seems like he's checking the label inside and the position of the bridge. This one is more for the musicians out there, but notice how the camera is always changing the angle so as not to show his playing and his technique, as the actor probably doesn't know how to play the violin. To be fair though, if the actor can play the instrument or can fake it well enough, then I personally prefer this approach to when they're just playing open strings, but the music on the film wants to make you believe that he's playing Mendelssohn's concerto or something like that. <laughs> Ben je bang dat ik er geen verstand van heb? Keep this phrase and this reaction in mind for later. Nee, nee, juist wel. Ja. Nou, maak model Stradivarius, rode wekenlak, zwakke inclinatie, signatuur, afwezig, winterwerk. I'm not sure he needed to play the violin to say that, but if you're going to judge how the instrument plays and sounds, then I'm sure it needs more than a few seconds. Needless to say that he didn't even need to tune the violin that clearly arrived after a trip, right? In regards to what he said though, I'm not sure what he means by poor inclination, maybe the projection, but it could be that it just translates different in violin making language, so it could just be a subtitle error. The rest of the things that he said seem like a legitimate conversation. Maar goed, uh, zie je er iets in? Neem je hem in consignatie? En in welke prijs denk je dan? 100, 100 gulden, zou ik zo zeggen. Al kan je voor dat bedrag beter een nieuw instrument aanschaffen. Maar... 100 gulden? Maar dat is voor die mensen, in die omstandigheden is dat, is dat prachtig. Zou je dat op een uh, papiertje kunnen krabbelen? Een soort reçu of iets dergelijks? Het is maar dat ik die Benjamin iets tastbaars kan geven. Doei. Dit part of the conversation also sounds convincing. And of course, 100 gulders can be a lot of money for some people. Even if I have no idea how much that would be in today's money. Wow. 
Oh, you've been trundled. This is the first time we get to take a proper look at his workshop and it seems quite legit. A lot of instruments hanging, which is okay considering he's more of a restorer and a dealer than a maker, and he has a shop in quite a good location, so of course he expects to sell them. Then we have some wood chips, some wood store, the molds, tools, and he has some bows and some horse hair to do bow rehairing. So here we can see him removing the top of a violin to fix something. Blowing the dust to take a better look at the instrument, good. And now he lost me. I'm not a restorer so I might be missing something, but I really don't get what he's doing with the knife now. He could be trying to clean the glue or something, but then those sounds don't match. What are those sounds? It seems like he's cutting a massive piece of wood with a knife. Again, no idea what he's doing. The next thing is for me perhaps the most interesting part of the movie. If you remember, I told you to keep in mind a part of a conversation and a reaction he had before, and now we're going to see another couple of examples of that. This is for iemand. A kastenmaker die zich vioolbouwer noemt. Weidunaar, een zoon. Overigens, navraag leerde ons dat u bij de Kamer van Koophandel als kastenbouwer geregistreerd staat. Vioolbouwer. Ik ben vioolbouwer. Kijk dus om me heen. Ziet u kasten? Ik niet. Ik zie alleen violen. See how he gets offended, almost insulted when he's called a cabinet maker. He feels he's more than a cabinet maker. He feels he's more than a woodworker. And that resonates a lot with how things are here. Among makers, it's normal to hear them shout in the word marengon at each other as a joke a lot. The word marengon means carpenter in Kermanese dialect and they use it as a way of saying, oh, you're not very precise. You might be wondering where I got this amazing t-shirt and this wonderful phone case. Well, if you want to help support my channel while getting some nice violin making apparel, then you can find these things on my Redbubble account. Link in description. Ah, you don't put the violin directly against the workman just like that. It's crushing all the back and the scroll. He could easily just place a cloth underneath, or else the most normal thing at this stage would be to simply hold the instrument with his body, but never the violin directly against the surface of the workbench. It's going to damage the varnish and the wood. absolute nightmare. Also that tuning technique though, plucking different strings always but moving the same peg, which by the way sounds like way too tough to move and he as Lucia should know that it needs to be lubricated the peg then. We can see a bit more of his tools here though and while most of them seem authentic I also feel like there are some tools missing which should be there although they might be spread along the workshop which is not very comfortable or they might be on the other workbench. And here we can see him working again, no varnishing, in a very rustic way, let's say. With that technique he used, a lot of varnish would go inside the F-holes, making a bit of a mess. But we can see he's shaky and nervous, so let's not be too judgy. That just looked like many of the students' workshops I've seen. Oh, and finally here we can see some more of those tools that were missing, some gouges and chisels, so that's great. So it makes me think that the people who made the movie maybe saw a workshop, they might have even talked to a violin maker, but that's it. There was no one giving them any directions on how to move or how to behave during the filming. I would be lying if I said that I'm a fan of this movie. and as it is for most people, when we see a professor not being portrayed in the best way, we find it a bit cringy. So I'm going to rate the movie with 5 F-holes out of 10, and the rate of the violin making scenes in the movie is going to be of 4 F-holes instead. A heart in winter. 
Daniel Auteuil, à Stéphane, Emmanuel Béa, à Camille, et André Dussoli, à Maxime. While the plot is not really complex, the story and the acting are very realistic, humane, and full of emotions. Stéphane is a violin maker and restorer working for Maxime's shop in France. And yes, in this one there are a lot of scenes of him working and in the workshop. Camille, who is Maxime's girlfriend, soon starts developing feelings for Stéphane instead, who remains cold and indifferent to her seduction. Once I showed this film to a colleague of mine, after which he told me from all the professions they could choose, they decided to go with a violin maker to make a very cold person. So that's a thought. Now get ready, because there are a lot of things to cover in this one. The film opens with his shot where he's preparing the top to glue it back to the ribs. Okay, we can take a good look at the workshop now. And it absolutely looks like a workshop. At least like the restoration workshop of Adila. The tools on the background, the cabinets, the disposition of all the items, the stools, just everything. And very importantly about what he's doing, the light is in the right place. See how this is not a light for the shot. This is a light to glue the top. Another detail which I really like is the number of clamps that are prepared on the table. Even if we will see in a second that the shot cuts only after putting a few, the director didn't just want to put a couple of clamps on the table, he wanted it to look real. I wouldn't be surprised if he actually made the actor close the whole thing. Even if this is not the method that I would use to glue the top, mainly because working alone I can't really call Maxime or anyone else to close the clamps for me, and because I feel like I would make a bit of a mess putting the glue directly onto the top and the ribs, the technique is valid and used. Also notice how careful they were on the amount of pressure put on the clamps. Not too much, if not it could damage the top, but not too little either. <laughs> The whole setup of the scene is so good. Maxime on the back leaning against the wall, Stefan listening, and even the fact that they made the G-string actually sound rough. Vous l'avez depuis trois ans. Quand on l'a acheté, il avait un son tendu, superbe. C'est un vieux. Non, on est inquiète parce qu'on a des enregistrements qui commencent dans 15 jours. On est déjà en répétition. De toute façon, il faut contrôler la tension de l'âme. Oui. It's a very good question the one he asked before. For how long have you had the instrument? That way he gets to understand if this is an unusual thing for the violin or if maybe it has always been that way and only now she's finding out which happens. According to the answer, you can then start thinking of what might be the cause of the problem and how to fix it. Also, I find it so interesting the way he looks at the violin at the beginning, almost more curious about the viome itself rather than trying to understand what was going on, which is something we do. But then he gets straight to the point and starts checking the bridge. Take a look as well at how he's holding the violin from the neck with one hand and from the chin rest and the chin rest mechanism with the other, trying to touch the varnish as little as possible. Faut le changer. Oui. Ça peut se faire assez vite. Si je change le chevalet, je suis obligé de corriger la touche. Ça peut prendre quelques jours. Mais on est en plein de répétition. Tu l'as déjà dit. Si vous voulez, je peux vous en prêter un autre. Non, non, merci, j'ai mon violon d'études. The whole dialogue is so realistic. 
I could literally imagine this scene happening in a big violin shop. And what he said makes total sense to me. Here is the only kind of sloppy thing, as we can see that he's not really removing anything. But it's really a very difficult thing to fake, and the sound effect matches the sound that working on that part of the bridge could make. The way he's looking at the bridge, all quite normal. Another great shot. He's protecting the instrument with a cloth from getting scratched by the fine tuner, which is something I always recommend doing even for changing strings. He has the E and the G strings on with enough tension to place the bridge in position and hold it. And the technique used to put it, it's the usual one. And the whole distribution of the bench is good too. There are a couple of things that maybe shouldn't be there, but I feel that that's what actually makes it very genuine. Like the Chingras adjuster or the old bridge. But there are things that he used and maybe then just forgot to put them away. It happens. He's checking that the bridge is aligned with the fingerboard, which is good. And the way he's holding the violin to do this, it's very natural as well. <laughs> That's interesting because I know that I would smile the same way that he did if I noticed a detail like that. Stéphane, tu m'as bien dit que Cornfeld cherchait un Gagliano. Oui, il a trouvé. Non, je crois pas. T'es sûr? That behind the scenes conversation sounds very authentic too. And this one is maybe my favorite scene in regards to violin making in this film, because of how good it is and because of how in only a few words it proves the research and attention to detail put on it. What Stefan's student did was the neck joint. And apparently when he applies pressure, the neck fits perfectly on the body of the instrument. However, you can hear a bit too many cracking sounds, which means that he had to put a bit too much pressure to fit it in. And while you may think, well, that's great, because it means that the next string will fit very well and never come out, in reality it means that once you put the hot glue and the wood expands, then the neck won't fit anymore in the space that it had. Or even worse, it can happen that when the wood expands and you clamp the neck to make it fit, then something cracks because there's too much pressure. So yes, enlarging it is the solution. For this, I feel that that conversation is just a joy of professionalism. You can tell how much effort the director put into making the film feel real, how much dedication was put into the dialogue, the acting and the sound effects. That is after enlarging it and now he's checking that the surface where the neck will be is perfectly flat. The boy is checking the projection, that is how high the prolongation of the fingerboard would be at the position of the bridge. And it's a very uncomfortable thing to do, but he's doing it great. And now, of course, he's making sure that the angle of the neck joint is right. Oh, I would never leave something like that to glue for the day after. Once I'm done with something that requires so much concentration as the neck joint, I want to glue it immediately. Oui? Ne quittez pas. Stéphane? Here we see him doing some retouches on the varnish, all good. I love how indifferent he sounds to the phone call though. Like, mm. At some point we see a more modest workshop, but this one also looks very genuine. The vibe is different, the environment is different, the distribution of the tools and workbenches is different, and even the type of clients that come to visit is different. Not only the violin making parts were great, but also Emmanuel acting as a violinist is impressive. One thing is trying to fake to act some simple violin playing, but a very different one is having to act Ravel's sonata with the camera focusing directly on her playing. 
not cutting scenes where the camera just shows some random fingers close-ups. During the credits, we can read Conseiller Lutherie and the name of Philippe Mahou, who is a famous violin maker in France. So great job on him and on the director and the production of the film for calling him, but mainly for listening to him. I love this film, the story, the cinematography, how realistic the acting is, and the music, which are mainly rebel pieces, are absolutely beautiful. And I left a lot of things out as I didn't want to spoil it. If you can, watch it. I'm going to rate the movie with 9.5 bridges and the violin making in the movie with 10 out of 10 bridges. So what do you think? Did you like the acting in these films? Have you seen any of them? Did I leave any of your favorites out? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to hit the like button if you liked the video and to subscribe to the channel for more.